Good morning! Today we're jumping into Ruth chapter 3 and we're going to find a very climactic turning point in our story. If you remember when, when Ruth and Naomi came back, there was the famine. Now the famine has ended. Uh, Ruth has been able to bring lots of barley home to Naomi, so there's food in the house. And pretty soon their season of widowhood is going to end as well. The events of chapter 3 happen between sunset and sunrise on a single day. Sunset and sunrise on a single day. And the story is very mysterious. It's very secretive. It happens in the dark of the night, in the, in the utmost secrecy. So it's a fun mystery. Open your Bibles and uh, we're going to look at chapter 3. Remember that when Ruth and Naomi first arrived back in Bethlehem, the plan was that Ruth would take care of Naomi and somehow in some way they would eke out a living that would be sufficient enough for them to support themselves. Because remember, they have no possessions, they have no land, they have no men to protect them or to provide for their needs. Ruth was Naomi's best hope for finding food and finding favor among the gleaners. The problem, though, is that the harvest season is very short-lived, and there are not always going to be fields of grain for, for them to glean from. What will they do when winter comes? Ruth is young. Will she ever meet a husband? Will she ever be able to get married and have children and, and find happiness? Would Elimelech's family line be extinguished forever? These were the questions that were surely playing in their minds as they were trying to get reestablished back in Bethlehem and figure out life together. But Naomi has a very clever plan in mind because so far things have gone very well between Boaz and Ruth. She discerns that God's favor has been on Ruth in every single circumstance. And now she's thinking if Ruth will marry Boaz, maybe all of them could live happily ever after. Well, let's look at chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? Now this might seem bold <laughs> um, to us because we don't have people inter, um, trying to matchmake us today, but in this culture they did. It was actually the parents who arranged the marriages for their children. And this is exactly what Naomi is preparing to do. Now, Naomi uses the word rest in a very interesting way. She says, shall I not seek rest for you? Well, if we turn in our Bibles back to Ruth chapter 1 and we look at verses 8 and 9, it says this, But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. See, Naomi knew that God provided rest for women under the umbrella of marriage, where there was land and food and extended family and children to carry on the family line. And instead, Ruth had chosen to leave that rest and to leave the security of her family of origin and to align herself with Naomi and with the God of Israel. So now Naomi is again seeking rest for Ruth in a relationship with Boaz. N Naomi has sensed from what Ruth has shared with her that Boaz is extending favor towards Ruth. And so she is going to be planning now to present Ruth to Boaz as a prospective bride. I mean, after all, he is their ki family kinsman redeemer just as the Lord has ordained. Notice though, that Naomi is actually becoming an answer to her own prayer. She is actually modeling one of the ways in which divine moments and human actions work together. Um, she's actually praying and thinking and crafting and orchestrating a plan and we're seeing that God is working and she is also participating in that. This is just a reminder to us that we are just not to always wait passively for things to happen, but rather to, to seize the initiative when opportunity presents itself. We must assume that God presents opportunities to us as answers to prayer. Well, in verse two, it says, see, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. 
See, Naomi knew that tonight, Boaz was going to be in a secluded spot where Ruth could talk to him privately under the cover of darkness. Now, let me explain a little bit about the ancient agricultural practices involving winnowing and a threshing floor. So first of all, we're learning a lot about ancient agriculture, aren't we? First of all, harvest grain was, was bundled in the field, as we talked about earlier, and then it was carried by a cart to a threshing floor. Now, a threshing floor was an open space with a, a hard rock stamped floor, and the grain would be threshed. That is, it would be beaten with a, a tooth uh, a toothed sledge and it would be trampled under animal hooves or it would be crushed with cartwheels in some way to remove the husks from the kernel, trying to, to break that down and separate the husks from the kernel. The winnowing process is the process of separating the kernels from the husks by tossing the mixture up into the air, into the breeze, and possibly for some reason, maybe weather conditions or whatever, Naomi knows that tonight is the night that this was going to be done. And then when they would toss it up into the air in the breeze, the wind would carry the chaff away while the heavier grain would fall to the floor near the winnower, the person who was doing the winnowing. The grain was then collected into piles, and then the owner of the grain would often sleep with those piles in order to protect them from robbers. So, Naomi instructs Ruth that she is to prepare herself for a special encounter with Boaz by taking five specific steps, which we see in verse 3. First, she, he, she tells her, you're to wash, therefore. So baths and ceremonial washings always preceded special events in the Jewish culture. It was always part of the process. You always washed before something special happened. Now Naomi is clearly asking Ruth to prepare herself like a bride for a wedding, to wash herself. And then second she says, and anoint yourself. So anointing oils were also used by brides to draw their husbands near with a fragrant aroma and just make themselves enticing. So she's asking her to anoint herself with oil and make herself smell pretty. And she says then, put on your cloak. Ruth probably didn't have very many clothes, but possibly she had one cloak for a special occasion. Now again, Naomi is instructing Ruth to prepare herself as a bride. And then the fourth thing she says is go down to the threshing floor. So Naomi is instructing Ruth about how to present herself to Boaz. You know, she's not to rush up to him and initiate a conversation. Rather, she's to remain in secret. She's to remain hidden. The threshing floor was surely a very dangerous place this time of year. It was where the, the pagans practiced sexual fertility rites and as acts of worship to their gods. So these involved prostitutes. So the potential for Ruth to be misunderstood was very, very high. So she says, she says, go down to the threshing floor, but she says, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So obviously she wanted Boaz to be in a good frame of mind when Ruth approached him. Naomi is leaving nothing to chance. She is crafting every detail of this plan. And, but she's also modeling human ingenuity as she seeks to orchestrate a very worthy goal. She's emulating the kind, of, the kind of divine providence that has been working in the backdrop of every scene so far. And then fifth, verse four, when, but when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. Can you imagine how embarrassing it would have been for Ruth if she, if she were to lie down at the wrong man's feet? Ah, and why the feet? Was this a sexual overture, which is often how people think? But actually, it wasn't. It was a very humble request for protection, and it symbolized a marriage proposal. Remember, rest is a woman finds rest in marriage, in a marriage proposal. That's where she finds provision and protection. So Naomi was trusting in Boaz's integrity and character that he would not take sexual advantage of Ruth, but he would actually understand the greater message behind her actions. Verse 5, and she replied, 
Ruth replies, all that you say I will do. Now, can you imagine how risky this would have felt for Ruth? First of all, she's a Moabitess. She is a foreigner in a strange land. This is a very strange custom to her. This is all brand new. She, she's never had any experience with this. And she's putting herself in a very compromising situation in the middle of the night in a very vulnerable location filled with men who are, are likely merry with drink and potentially celebrating the harvest with prostitutes. But Ruth trusts Naomi. She just trusts her. She knows that Naomi lives by faith. She has seen how God has blessed Naomi's faith and obedience and how he has orchestrated all the details of their return to Bethlehem. You know, but would God bless this very clever plan? Or would Naomi's cleverness put her on a collision path with God's best plans? And Ruth didn't know the answer to that question, but in the moment, she did agree to do all that Naomi had asked of her. And here's the, the principle, the truth, that I want to draw from this chapter so far, these first five verses. Claiming God's promises by faith does not eliminate human activity. Claiming God's promises by faith does not eliminate human activity. You know, Ruth was not only a hearer of the word, she was a doer of the word. Ruth was willing to step out of her comfort zone, and she was willing to obey the Lord in a very awkward place, at a, a very dark, secretive time. She was willing to step out and obey the Lord. Do you know that our willingness to obey the Lord is the secret to actually knowing what He wants us to do and being blessed when we do it? You know, the fact that we're willing to obey Him is, is one of the secrets to knowing what He wants us to do and how we're going to be blessed as we do it. Uh, Jesus talks about this in John 7, 17, where He says, If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. You know, we can't um, be like cafeteria Christians, you know, who, who pick and choose what we want to obey or what we want to do. God expects us to be all in, to be eager and ready to hear from Him and to take action when He leads us, to accept, that all, to accept all He has for us and to obey Him completely. I want to ask you, what is God asking you to do today as a result of hearing His Word to you? How are you being challenged to take what you've heard and to put it into action? Is there an area of your life that the Lord is asking you to trust Him and obey? And does it feel precarious to you? Does it feel risky? Does it feel uncomfortable? I want to share with you four promises that God has made to you, and He's made these to me as well. He's made them to us through His Word. God promises four things, four P words, His presence, His protection, His power, and His provision. And let me give you some scripture that you can pray back to Him on these things. God's presence, Hebrews 13, 5, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He promises that He will always be with us. He will never, ever not be with us. God's protection, Genesis 15, 1, where he says, Fear not, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. God is our shield. And certainly in the Psalms, there's lots of great verses we could claim on this as far as God being our rock, our fortress, our stronghold, our mighty tower. God is our protection. The third thing is God's power. Isaiah 41.10 Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. God promises to be with us and to, to be our God and to strengthen us. And then the fourth thing is God's provision, also from 41.10. He says, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So think about that. God promises us his presence, his protection, his power, and his provision. And you can claim these promises by faith. Ruth claimed God's promises by faith when she told Naomi, your God is my God. And then she took action by, by uh, leaving her homeland, by traveling to Bethlehem, by working to secure food and provision for Naomi. She's demonstrating her commitment to her faith by seizing every opportunity that God has provided for her. What opportunities has God provided for you or placed right in front of you? 
What action do you need to take in order to demonstrate your faith in God's promises? Let me pray about that for us today. Father, I, I can't help but think about just um, the opportunity that you gave me to start this video devotional series a whole year ago. And I had no idea that a year later I would still be here with these friends. But thank you for calling me to obey you and for all the blessings that we've received together being in your word this, this entire year. Thank you that when you call us to obey you, it, it's always good. It's good for us it's, and it's glorifying to you. And, and I pray that, that we would just have courage to step into the places where you have blessing waiting for us. And all we need to do is simply agree and step out in faith and be all in. And um, you are so faithful to meet us and to lead us and to, as we've just said, to provide uh, your, your power and your provision and your presence with us. So we thank you for that, Lord. Help us to trust you more today and to listen more clearly to your leading in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the story of Ruth. There's so much that we can apply to our lives. So tomorrow we're going to look at verses 6 through 15, and we're going to see the promise that um, Boaz made. So I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you then.